Welcome. I'm Harmony Slater, your host of the Finding Harmony podcast. Over the past 20 years, I've taught thousands of yoga teachers and students to explore the intersection between ancient wisdom and modern everyday life, using mind-body practices to heal, awaken, and manifest their dreams from the inside out. This podcast is a sanctuary for those feeling overwhelmed by life's challenges. Are you ready to jump in and discover how these challenges aren't actually in the way, but are the way to finding harmony? Let's invite the magic back in. Hello, happy summer. Welcome to the Finding Harmony podcast. Today is part one of two with a dear friend of mine, Stephen Thomas. We are talking about the changes in the yoga world, in the yoga industry from when we first started teaching way back in the early 2000s until now. It's been 25 years almost of teaching yoga and teaching on an international level. So we're going to talk a lot about What's changed? How things have been different? How COVID and online spaces has changed in-person yoga classes and just our experience with the evolution. He has the yoga studio called Swarupa in Switzerland. And so he has a lot of experience. He's taught both online, in person, in retreats, in workshops, for many, many years in North America, in Asia, and all over the place. So I think you're going to get a lot of insights from this conversation. And next week, we're going to dive into the world of breathwork. So that's also going to be juicy. So stay tuned for next week as well. But let's get going with part one. And I hope you love it. Hi, and welcome to the Finding Harmony podcast. So happy you're here joining me today because Russell is away, but I am joined by the ever jubilant, ever <laughs> profound, ever youthful <laughs> Stephen Thomas. Hello, Stephen. How are you? Hi, Harmony. It's good to see you. Good it's to see good you. to see you too. It's been mm-hmm. a long time. It has. It has. Yeah. I was thinking about the first time we met back in 2004 in Mysore. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and 20 years, yeah. Yeah, 20 years. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Over 20 years ago now, I think. <laughs> right. It's unbelievable, right? Yeah. And you really encouraged me to begin studying pranayama and mm. sort of was expounding on Sri Opitawari's, you know, profound skills as a teacher and guru and that yeah. really sent me down a path of pranayama and learning about breathing and breath work. But we share so many funny little intersections over the last 20 years because you're also Canadian. <laughs> That's right, yeah. I mean, it's interesting, isn't it? Because this time was so potent for a lot of us, these early 2000s. Yeah. And then we were all studying and doing different things. And you can't, I mean, when you just said that now, I didn't recall who introduced who <laughs> to what. Yeah. We were We were all kind of just sharing what we were doing in those days. It was quite beautiful. And yes. Yeah. And there wasn't so many options either. You had to, if you wanted to study with someone, you had to actually go to the place where they were to learn from Mm -hmm. them. It's so different from now. (laughs) I think it was, we are a little bit in this second wave vintage, I feel like. You know, we came into it in the late 90s. It was still, you could still say that was pre-internet. I mean, it, yeah. In terms of the yoga world, it was word Very of mouth, so. and and there wasn't this tradition of traveling teachers so much even at that point, and people weren't running around doing workshops, so you had to go and find it, right? It was just the dawn of that. Then probably there was a wave before us in the 70s and 80s, which was even more difficult to, <laughs> to access yeah. the teaching. We were kind of just at the dawn of this accessibility, but I always think that was such a potent time where you still had to, you had to seek it out. You had to have some hunger and thirst and you had to have a sangha, some friends who would guide you and lead you, right? And yeah, and it, totally. And it was, I think it was really incredible too, because the sangha was still pretty small. Yes. So... Yeah. We all really kind of got to know each other and kept in touch. And I know you mm-hmm. 
I, I can't remember if you were actually in Hong Kong at that time or you were just starting to work with Pure in Hong Kong, but it was sort of the golden age for being a yoga teacher, I think, because there wasn't so many yoga teachers. <laughs> no, it was unbelievable. In fact, I mean, it was the, that was the time where this little studio that we had in, in Whistler, Canada, yeah. had spawned. I mean, that's a whole podcast in itself, but that little <laughs> studio had spawned an idea. It was two guys who came to Whistler to ski, and Patrick actually taught them some yoga, and yeah. they were a bit blown away by it. Make a long story short, they went back, and they had always dreamed of opening as a side business yeah. a gym, and they, they just got turned on by yoga. This was 2001, I believe, or two. And they ended up opening up Pure Yoga, and then they invited us to come. I mean, that was just so fortuitous and serendipitous. <laughs> it was crazy. I just, I, it was way over my head. I was way over my head. Yeah, but you had such a sweet deal. I remember, like yes, housing and like a food it was budget, crazy. And, like thousands and I, thousands of dollars. <laughs> yeah, it was crazy. And I said to them, I mean, I had nothing to lose. I was so naive. I just said. I just need a lot of time off to study and to travel. And of course, it was a jumping off point, Hong Kong, to get yeah. to India and to get to Thailand, which is the two places that we were going all the time. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and they said, sure, just make sure the, the room is full. And But to your point, the biggest issue we had in those days was we couldn't find teachers. There was yeah. far too many students for the number of teachers that would exist. And so... I think also, like, I'm jumping ahead a little bit here, but it's why this teacher training phenomena exploded at that time, because mm. actually the number of people getting into yoga in, in that phase of time far outstripped the number of teachers that were there. Yeah, I mean, the mere fact that they had to bring teachers from Canada or yes. North America yeah, yeah. or Europe over yeah. to Asia to teach. I yes. mean, Asia really hadn't kind of, gotten into the yoga no. craze. They were just starting. So there was really yeah. no teachers in those places like Taiwan yeah. or Hong Kong yeah. or, you know, yeah. anywhere in China. <laughs> yeah. I mean, Taiwan was fascinating because there was no teachers there. And yet that culture had such a rich tradition of Qigong and Taoism and mm -hmm. Tai Chi. And they really were very aware of prana chi mm -hmm. and yeah. they were aware of how to move and breathe and so it came to them quickly alex was there and uh, yeah. and they were phenomenal students and they very quickly became wonderful teachers but there was a moment where actually there were so many people who wanted to learn it but there were no teachers and, yeah. and 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 then it turned it balanced itself out and then there was quite a beautiful strong local teaching community but it took time yeah yeah. yeah, it's so interesting to have this through line of watching yoga really grow and being in it at the very kind of, maybe not the origin of it, but early yeah. stages. Yeah. <laughs> into wave this, two, wave two. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> wave two, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Into like late stage capital yoga. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Into the, into the literal free for all that we exist in now. Yeah. yeah that's been quite a trajectory to watch that. When do you think it changed? When did like teaching and teachers, because you have a school now mm -hmm. still and, mm -hmm. and you were traveling and teaching for a while too, but when did you really notice like, oh, things are really shifting here? Do you think it's a recent kind of shift that's happened or do you think it started even before the pandemic? I know the pandemic like was a massive push where everyone was online all of a sudden and it yeah. really felt like it's changed the whole feeling and landscape of yoga, but I'm curious if you feel like it was kind of starting even before that. Yeah, I mean, I think if I lean back to 2015, 16, 17, mm -hmm. this range, there was still a lot of dedication to, you know, the yoga studio. Mm -hmm. People would see the yoga studio as a focal point the yoga studio would often, if it wasn't an aligned studio, like in an Iyengar or an Ashtanga tradition or something like that, if it was a mixed use studio, which is what really realistically most studios are like that, yeah. Within that umbrella of that studio might exist some traditional forms and some, you know, let's say more open forms and yeah. modern forms. 
but what I thought was interesting is the studentship or people in the marketplace would come to the studio. The studio served as a focal point and you would come in and students would sort of align themselves to a tradition or a teacher and they'd be involved and they would probably have some other outlets for study, but they would focus on a, on a studio, mm -hmm. let's say. Yeah. yeah. And that changed dramatically. I mean, mm. I, I, I still feel like that was pretty solid up until 17 or 18. And what seems to have happened, I think, is two things. One is, at some point, <laughs> the game of the teacher trainings. I mean, people who get into yoga now don't realize 20 years ago there was not really teacher trainings. No, just not David really. Swenson. <laughs> yeah, right? I mean, Paul started a little bit. And, yeah. I mean, you yeah, know. Yeah, he was one of the first. Yeah, and those teacher trainings were mostly steeped in some tradition, right? Mm -hmm. Mostly. Yeah, 100%. I would dare say. I mean, they, they mostly were. And then you had things like, schools which didn't have a teacher training per se, which were more like you just were in the school over a long period of time and you mm -hmm. maybe the teacher training was four years or eight years or it was until the teacher said, okay, assist yeah. my class or substitute my class. But the teacher training phenomenon, which maybe we can trace that back to the early 2000s, I think what happens with that model is that it starts to dilute as time mm -hmm. goes on because... I was thinking today as I was coming here to, to, to talk with you, like that um, people used to do a teacher training because they knew you and, yeah, or they wanted to become a teacher because they studied with you or practiced with you in, in your tradition or in your way yeah, or in your lineage, whatever it was. And when they finished their teacher training, they stayed in yeah. that umbrella. Yeah. And when you fast forward that model, it became more and more, or at least I noticed over the years, it became more and more that the ratio of people in the trainings started to shift, yeah. where by, by mid-2015 to 18 in this range, you would have a teacher training. You know, I would talk to people who hold these things, and they would say, I almost don't know anybody who's in the training. You know, yeah. and then you do the training. Maybe the quality was very high. It was a very, very good thing. And then the students yeah. would disperse and they wouldn't be there anymore. So yeah. it there was no thread holding this thing together. You know what I mean? Totally, totally. I'm actually thinking it just a little bit like about, because we both assisted on one of Paul's teacher training. Yeah, yeah. And in, in Samui and... And it was a little bit of both, right? Like he would have yes. people coming in that probably never went back to Yoga Thailand and just like it was yep. just a through place because it was a vacation. So let's do a teacher yep. training while on vacation. Yep. Mm -hmm. And then he had some students that would were like more regular that kept coming back every year to do a retreat, do a So it is sort of like interesting. That was definitely a, a shifting, I think, kind of yes. time where... There was like more seeking of, of experiences, yoga experiences, yoga teachers, like tasting, taste testing, tasting rather than buffet. as you say, yeah, yeah pame. <laughs> as, like rather than as you say, you know, really like taking a teacher and even, I mean, you probably heard it and I heard it so much, like you take one teacher, you study with mm -hmm. one teacher and this whole kind of like guru model and, you mm -hmm. know, this idea of parampara being a single line. Mm -hmm. um, feels like it was starting to kind of branch a little bit. And it was interesting because it was yeah. also the time, I think, when this, when even in Mysore, they started really like talking a lot about parampara, parampara. You have to take yeah, the lineage. Yeah. You have to be in line with the teacher and no outside yeah. studying with other teachers. And no, and I feel like that mm -hmm. might have been even a little bit of a, you know, always when there's expansion in one direction, right? There's kind of like a closing in and a contraction on, yeah. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. in the other direction. So it is interesting to kind mm -hmm. of reflect on on the cultural yeah. dynamics that might have like intensified this sort of one line of thinking, which is like you take one guru, you yeah. know, death and coming if you take two. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> versus, <laughs> yeah. Versus but like, that ratio tests. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, the ratio of the buffet, it, it just started, it kept changing. So I think yeah. when you fast yeah. forward, 
Then you had people starting to run teacher trainings or run schools or open studios. Don't even say teacher training. Just they started to open their own shala or their own studio, however you want to call it. And they had no ground or lineage or, or like where. And so it just gets thinner and thinner. And then I, and I mean, I don't mean it in a totally negative way, but you can see where things start to thin out, where there's no, like, what's behind this? You know, what's holding that? What's the reference yeah. points for the teacher to draw back towards and to draw inspiration from? I mean, I couldn't do it yeah. without that. So, but if you, then you, back to your original question, I think COVID came, everybody yeah. jumped online. Every And I think if I just look at what's happened in Switzerland as a microcosm, Everybody jumped online and everybody started to teach from their living room, for, for lack of a better expression, right? <laughs> yeah. And when things got back to normal, which happened relatively quickly here, something fundamentally had changed. And that was that there was an appetite in the student, which didn't exist before, to go and do yoga in someone's living room or to do it online with them. And that changed the way that the studio played a role of sort of a central meeting point for people. And mm -hmm. that was a dramatic change, or I've experienced as that as a dramatic change. Although recently I find quite a strong um, affinity for people to, to get back. They're just craving connection again. Yeah. Yeah. I think there's something really powerful too about accountability and mm -hmm. showing up for yourself because there's someone else holding the space for you yes. that makes yeah. practicing so much easier than trying yes. to do it at home in your living room yeah. you know where you can turn off the camera or you know yes, you may yes, or may yes. not have to show up which is is yeah. totally cool and i have yeah. like zero problems with people practicing not on camera if, you know they're yeah. not feeling it because i mean the camera itself is kind of like a little bit of a distraction right you're like always like checking yeah. yourself out and yeah yeah how does my like... side angle look exactly you know like <laughs> thought it looked better than that <laughs> yeah, <laughs> <So>. <laughs> right. i mean it, it has like both like positive yeah, and yeah. negative kind of yeah, things yeah. right it can help mm -hmm. you because you can be like oh i should yeah i should really do yeah. that or mm -hmm. it can also be a, just another layer of kind of like taking you out of yourself rather than helping you go into yourself yeah i mean i was listening yesterday to svoboda robert svoboda yeah. and yeah. It was a beautiful talk about Vimalananda, and which was his tantric guru, and and then in the conversation he was talking with uh, Dr. Fred Smith, I think, and they were just sharing stories about time, the time with Vimalananda just before his death, and I mean it's not a yeah it's obvious to say this, but but it's so important to remember it that we, they were talking about being in the field of someone who has progressed along the along any trajectory for mm -hmm. a little while whatever the whatever it is a painter a musician a meditator mm -hmm. and so there's something which is happening in the field because the mind is not fixed just within ourselves you know it's fluid yeah. so yeah. this idea of being with others changes completely the experience of what it is we're doing and yeah. and that's beautiful and that is part of why we would practice together there's certainly like amazing reasons to practice alone that's part of yeah. the practice <laughs> yeah but there's so much gathered through this transmission right through the yeah. shared karma and the shared experience yeah which is missing when when we let go of those sort of lineages or traditions or being connected even as spiritual friends like you know we don't i, I struggle sometimes when i'm teaching because i think oh, i don't i've never been interested to be a guru that's for sure but yeah there's something which can be offered through being in each other's field of experience i'm stating the obvious but no, this is beautiful. a bit what 
what misses somehow when everything is so dispersed and we're catching mm -hmm. things on a very thin level only, kind of grab yeah. from it, just consume. I mean, we, we live in this consuming culture. And yeah. rather than a participatory sort of experience, yeah. Yeah, and I think, I mean, I think you're speaking to something that sometimes we miss if you, especially if you haven't gone deep into something, like mm -hmm. if you've just been tasting, you mm -hmm. know, and I mean, not to be cliche, because we all, I think, well, maybe not all of us, but we, you, I definitely know you've heard this one, but, mm. you know, digging the well really deep yeah. versus digging yes. many, many wells, right? And yes. You only find the water when you dig one well and you keep going, even after you don't find water, you know, on the second month and the third month and the fifth year yeah. and the 10th year, you know, eventually yeah. you find the water. Mm -hmm. um, but this idea that only through really dedicating yourself to a path. And I think you can define that in different ways. So I don't think it needs mm -hmm. to be like so restrictive of like only Ashtanga yoga, right? But <laughs> understanding mm -hmm. what your path is um, or what the method is that you want to learn mm -hmm. and spending time with it. And time is much more than one year. Mm -hmm. <laughs> right? Like the longer yeah, you I mean, spend practicing anything, yeah. right? And this mm -hmm. goes for, like you say, with music, art, you know, mm -hmm. I don't know, mm -hmm. coaching, therapy. Like if you yeah. want to get good at something, you have to do it and you have to practice yeah. it and you have to study with a master, with someone who's excellent at it and learn from yeah. them and be in their presence and watch how they interact and how they do the thing that they're doing. And the more mm -hmm. you can be with someone who's truly masterful at a craft, like really in their presence and watching and observing and, and learning mm -hmm. and studying, the faster you're going to grow and the better you're going to be in yourself. And it's not about mimicking, but it's about understanding how they approach something, right? It's understanding like the methodology of how they're doing the thing that they're so masterful at. And then mm -hmm. like allowing that to kind of get absorbed into your cells so that you can become masterful in your own way at that thing that you're interested in. Yeah. And I think we kind of do miss that when we're just like tasting all the time, all these different little yummy bites of different things you know <laughs> yeah or just asking like you know tell me how to do this and then i'll go and do it and yeah and that's very very different i was thinking as you were yeah. speaking that i mean even just uh, back to this very recent um, listening yeah. to svoda talking about Vivananda, ananda he said you know he didn't really teach us anything we watched how he moved through life and we were just close to him and he said, you know, when I think back, I mean, there wasn't any grand lectures or any big dissertations. Yeah. It was, we were with him and we observed and through observing, we somehow mimicked, yeah, like to use your word, we would mimic it or we would experience yeah. it through his experiencing it. And then it reminded me that, I mean, a, a student gave me a very small booklet years ago, which was written by a tennis coach in the seventies, I think, and it's, it's, <laughs> yeah. it's about Buddhism and teaching tennis. And it was about a tennis coach who got into Buddhist practices. And then, I mean, maybe I'll get it a bit wrong, but I'll paraphrase it, that he was teaching people how to hit the ball and how to play tennis by explaining it to them. Do this and don't do this and do this and don't do this. And, right. and then he realized there's quite limited success in this idea of just presenting sort of the the written framework or the you know, the do's and don'ts. And he yeah. said, he changed it a little bit and he said, just watch me hit the ball. Just watch me. Yeah. And, and then he said, now do what I did. <laughs> and he said the success, I mean, I'm really paraphrasing it, but it was beautiful. Yeah, yeah. The, su the success rate went just way, way, way up. Just feel what I'm doing and watch what I'm doing and mimic it, like not just visually, but mimic the whole experience of it. That's really beautiful, I find, yeah. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. It's like an embodied experience. Yes, I mean, I think, yeah, yeah. 
we learn yeah, in different it's... ways too, right? Mm-hmm. Like, so <laughs> it's kind of involving all of our senses to actually yes. learn something. Yes. Yeah, yeah. I thought, you know, this, I love this, <laughs> the story of the digging the wells for sure. <laughs> we've, <laughs> we've talked about that a lot, but, or think about that a lot. And I always, I said to you last night, like I, for me, I mean, it doesn't work for everybody, but for me, I've always sort of held naturally a stance of 70-30, which is I've felt like 70% of my practice goes into one way, whatever mm-hmm. that is. And Tuari always told, you know, find something you love because you have to love it. And, and yeah. then, then just dedicate some time and watch what will happen. Just be with it for a long time. Yeah. And... And then 30%, I mean, that was my own thing. I just thought, you know, I have enough vata. I, I need to like explore a little bit on the on the outside <laughs> edges of things. But it's always helped me to stay curious and non-dogmatic. And, and it's given me a reference to question my own traditions and my own ways. And sometimes it's informed me. I'm like, well, that's very interesting. I would, I find that very useful. I'll bring that in. And this 70-30 rule, you know, or whatever it is, 80-20, <laughs> It seems to have inverted with a lot of people. They have something which is central to them, but it, it's like 20 or 30%, and then the rest is just <laughs> all over the place. And yeah. it's hard to grow that way in any path, yeah. 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 Yeah, and I mean, I, I think also there's like a... There's a time. There's a time for experimentation as well to find what yes. you love. Yes. Yeah. But then yeah. you actually have to find it. <laughs> You know, that's hard. I mean, that's hard for a lot of people now because there's so much on offer. I think that's hard. (laughs) People are just, (laughs) and uh, I mean, how do you feel about that? I I mean, I think. Yeah, no, I I mean, I get overwhelmed thinking about it. (laughs) Yeah, you have to. There's a lot. There is a lot. (laughs) To some, to some extent, I think, it's easy to get paralyzed by choice, right? Like, I mean, the, yeah. the beginning of choice is the beginning of suffering somehow, in a way. <laughs> totally. It yeah. is, right? And yeah. And so then, isn't it also true, like, it's you just have to pick something. Just, I mean, pick something you like and then just focus on that. And, you know, David Frawley, who my wife and I study with yeah. a lot, he always says, just why don't pick something, get out of this paralysis with so many things, pick something and just dedicate the next couple of years to that and see what happens. Watch what happens. Yeah. I mean, look at this even, I mean, it's, I'm inspired just, I, we haven't seen each other for a long time. And then you've obviously dedicated a lot of energy to this and, and then it yeah. gathers some momentum and it's, and it, and, but it's hard, isn't it? Because there will be tough periods and there will be boring plateaus and this is where many people jump off right yeah they, they yeah. find the first you know that it's not linear it kind of you know does a bit of this mm-hmm. and sometimes it's just like this and you have yeah. to ride the plateau for a long time yeah i think if anything that's like what a daily ashtanga yoga practice has kind of taught me the most and even like even in periods where I've let it go and just been like, you know what, I can't do this. It's not working for me right now. Mm -hmm. Um, What I've taken from all of the, that foundational work, all of that groundwork in, in, you know, doing the thing every day is, is that discipline and consistency. And I know, I know I can always take that and apply it to anything that I do. And I do. Right. I mean, I think yeah. that's kind of the gift in when you're really into something and you're really disciplined to it and creating a craft mm-hmm. out of it where you want to get really good at it. You understand mm-hmm. like, oh, if I really want to get good at this, I actually have to do the thing and yeah. I have to do it every day or at least yeah. like fairly regularly, like consistently yeah. or I'm yeah, not going to grow. I'm not going to get better. Yeah, it's impressive. Yeah. And, and it's it's beautiful to see anybody who's dedicated time to anything like that. It's yeah. to be bowed down to because it's a big effort to do that. But you're right. It has a it has a vibration which goes into other aspects of life because it gives a trust and an endurance. Yeah. 
you know, yeah. it and it, you know, start to understand a little bit the nature and rhythm of things. Mm -hmm. And this yeah. can be applied, right, to other things. Yeah. Yeah, I guess that's why, like, age with age comes wisdom because <laughs> you've actually like endured life so. for so long. <laughs> I think so. <laughs> I hope so. Look, yeah, you can look back and be like, yeah, you know what? A lot of it's not that important. <laughs> What's important is the endurance. <laughs> yes. Yeah, yeah. 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 yeah just yes. enjoying your life, staying alive, you know, mm. enjoying the simple things. <laughs> yes. And yeah, it's true. That's true. We get mm. so caught up on, on things that ultimately, are, I don't know, maybe just like, like passing by, like, you know. I guess maybe that's also where jnana yoga comes in, like going to the essence of something rather than getting fixated on the maya or the illusion of reality, right? And I think yeah. often we get so caught up in the illusion and like, well, this is right and this is wrong and this is correct mm -hmm. and this is incorrect. And and I mean, that's all an illusion. That's all stuck mm -hmm. in duality. <laughs> yeah. And so it's like, step back and what's you know what's sort of the essence of of existence you know and like connect to that and the stuff yeah. that's like so seems so volatile from a you know right and wrong perspective kind of softens and you're like i don't yeah, know I think... does it really matter if someone practices an hour and a half a day or five minutes or not at all i don't know does that really matter if they're actually thinking about yoga or if they're like living it in their life if they're working on these other limbs like is asana does it really mean that much about someone i don't know <laughs> yeah i think that i mean there's a lot of different <laughs> answers to those questions that a lot of the i mean there's there's clearly a stage also where we have to entrench ourselves in it you know and and yeah and and work through some karmas and work through the body or the breath or the mind mm -hmm. there's, there's definitely those very intense phases yeah. they don't need to carry their themselves like that the whole way mm -hmm. but it's it's interesting because to to know something is to have a relationship to it over a long period of time right so yeah. whatever the practice is that we're doing to cultivate somehow the, a relationship to it is to understand the nature of things because you're not alone you're with that thing you know mm. Mm -hmm. And yeah, also I think as you age through it, hopefully some wisdom comes, which allows sort of the inner teacher to to slowly evolve. So then one can, I, I noticed for instance that, you know, there was a phase where I felt like the intensity of my practice needed to soften quite a bit. and. Mm -hmm. And the length of time in it needed to reduce. There were other priorities, kids, and and yeah. uh, I felt that yeah, I was getting older. I didn't have that same power. This this is Fire. the story, you know. Some parts yeah. of it were a story I was telling myself, sure. and some were my inner teacher saying, "Slow down a little bit." But then the same inner teacher, a few years ago, said, "It's actually the sattvas getting a little bit heavy again and tamasic and." Yeah mentally and physically I could feel and it called again for like another little resurgence back into the tapas mm -hmm. or back into the strength or the intensity of the practice that was fun to to also see like that the practice would meet different phases of life yeah and usually yeah. we would you know at the beginning you need a teacher to kind of highlight that because the ego can <laughs> trick you quite quickly you're like no, yeah. this is what I need, I'm sure. <laughs> but, yeah. but maybe the inner teacher wakes a little bit up over the course. Do you think so? And then you can feel yeah, a little bit so. more. I think so. I mean, it's it's hard to like put yourself back into a mindset of like not knowing anything about yoga. <laughs> because yes. it's been so many days and years of just thinking yeah. about yoga, yoga, yoga. <laughs> but, mm -hmm. And and by that, I mean, not just like, you know, asana, but just like yoga as a lifestyle, as a way yeah, of yeah. being in the world. But I think, yeah, coming into it as a new student without any reference points 
I think that is what a teacher is for, actually, is to really give you that guidance and that instruction and to be your mirror so that they're reflecting back to you kind of what they're seeing. Like, you're pushing too hard here. You can relax. Mm -hmm. Um, mm -hmm. You know, it's getting a little lazy. You can put a little fire in there or, yeah. you know, to really be that mirror for the student because it's really hard to see ourselves. I mean, e even as a teacher, it's hard. You can't see yourself. <laughs> so you hard, need yeah. like either peers or teachers or, you know, other people in your life to help you see yourself. And when you yeah. start seeing like, oh, yeah, there's that message. There's that reflection. There's, you know, then you're starting to, I think, connect more deeply with the inner teacher um, yeah. inside because you're you're using life as your mirror, as your teacher. But having that skill, it takes it definitely takes some practice. And I think having a guide or a guru or a teacher, whatever you, you know, a mentor, <laughs> a friend who's a little further along the path that you've entered into a relationship with of saying, like, can you guide me? Um, that's kind of essential to actually learn to practice anything. I mean, if I wanted yeah. to learn to paint, I kind of need to find someone who knows how to paint to at least show me the basics. The technique, or like, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. To dance. The structure, or, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, or like get this kind of paint, don't get this kind of paint, or, you know, what do you want to paint? What do you like to paint? You know, try this, yeah. try that, try this, right? You kind of need someone to help guide you it shortcuts the learning of course you can learn anything on your own life will show you because i think life is ultimately you know the teacher the guru <laughs> it, yeah. it will show you but it might take 50 years to you know get there yeah, i always it could have I taken always, you five <laughs> yeah i always thought it's a little bit like you were standing i mean what you just said just brings up a lot of interesting feedback i try to remember this in my memory um <laughs> But, it, you know, I thought a lot the last decade, this metaphor of standing at the um, front of a forest, you know, mm. and, you know, you want to get somewhere and all you know, it's on the other side of the forest. I mean, so, yeah, if you just walk in the forest and start walking, you will eventually get there, but it might take a lifetime. <laughs> You do yeah. a lot of circles and you'll, years. you know, you'll trip over a lot of branches and you'll hurt yourself and you get stuck mm -hmm. and then you think you're going south and you're going north. But if there's a path, you know, then it, mm -hmm. it's giving some guidance and there's, there's a way. So you sort of step on the path a little bit. And I think, you know, we were talking at the beginning about, you know, what happened in the yoga scene. And one of the things that I see a lot without being... Mm -hmm. too critical is this movement of of instruction being very open mm. very very open so it's like do what you want do what you feel what do you feel like mm -hmm. right now and this is a beautiful gesture i think but to learn something needs uh, it it actually the the student needs to narrow the field and then the practice itself will become the teacher. Even the teacher is not really the teacher, right? If, you know, like if I think of Nadi Shodhana, Tawari had to instruct me how to do it properly. And often he would say, he would make a subtle adjustment to it. Mm -hmm. Not so often, actually, but sometimes he would say, yeah, you read the pulse and comment on something. Yeah. And he would refine the technique. But then I remember so often he would say, just don't focus on me. Just do this like I just showed you until I see you again, eight months, nine months, whatever. Let the practice that I just taught you stick with it, really with it. And then it will teach you something, the, the practice itself, right? And I just think that's so useful. So you're right. It's like the teacher acts as this guide and mirror, absolutely. And a little bit like... Um, Jack Cornfield would say about his meditation teacher, when he asked him, what, what are you doing for me? And he said, I'm just kind of watching you walking along a very narrow ridge. And I'm just, all I'm doing is just saying a little bit to the left. <laughs> no, no, no. A little bit to the right, you know, don't fall off because it's a razor's edge, you know? And he said, that's all I'm doing. Just, but you have to do the walk. You know, I, I show you where the ridge is. I help you a little bit not to fall off it. 
even showing you where the ridge is is so beautiful. And then yeah. you have to walk it. Then walk the ridge. Don't walk 17 of them. Like one, like you said, <laughs> one quarter of the way. Walk one and watch what happens. Yeah. And that's amazing. Just take a practice like Ashtanga or whatever it is or the pranayama that I was taught. Stick with it and let the practice become the guru, actually. And Yeah. I think there's then, something so beautiful in what you said, too, about... I mean, it's something that I would often kind of criticize, like vinyasa classes or like some of these other classes, um, you know, where it is like, do what you feel. And mm -hmm. the whole point of yoga is actually to like balance or limit or reduce, <laughs> weaken the forces of the raga dwesha on us. Yeah, right? yeah, so yeah. the desire mm -hmm. and the aversion are supposed to become less so that our yeah. mind is balanced mm -hmm. and so when we're yeah. just doing what we feel then we're actually strengthening raga dvesha <laughs> and so yeah and and the opposite of yoga <laughs> yeah yeah i mean it's true actually it's it's very much strengthening that it's just i just stick with what i want and push away what i don't want or narodaha right i mean if i because i anger has been such yeah. a big influence on me yeah. so many times i think the the obsession with the alignment can be mistaken and it can be taught as an obsession without a doubt. But the intention of it often was that when you're in Trikvanasana, I want you to be able to feel the outer edge of your little toe. And mm -hmm. the beauty of that is that it's a channeling, right? It's a narrowing of the vrittis, a narrowing of the, of the awareness through one channel into one place as a meditation, maybe it's a line along the side of the ribs, down through the outer hip and into the little toe. And it's beautiful to be in that form and feel like I can move my consciousness mm. like an erodaha in a channel into that space. And so maybe it's like you said, it's, it's both the weakening of the glaciers when there is a direction and a focus and the strengthening of the consciousness into a channel where it has to yeah. sit. I mean, go into shoulder stand for five minutes and see, I mean, get yourself in a safe position of it for sure. Don't hurt yourself, but then be in it and be still. And mm -hmm. then it becomes like Chittipriti Narodaha, right? Yeah. And you have to be with it. Yeah, that's really making me think of something mm -hmm. else that I think is yeah. really essential to yoga that, that gets missed sometimes when we're, um, so focused on these external sort of points of validation, like different asanas, mm -hmm. is what you're talking about in that alignment or in that asana is the focus of the mind into the subtle energy channels and into the experience of the movement of the subtle energy within the yeah. body, mm -hmm. which is like the essence of yoga asana. Like that is what yeah. asana is meant to be really is turning the attention inward to focus on these channels, on these energy channels and the movement of prana in the body. And mm -hmm. I mean, ultimately, right, to be able to channel that energy through shashumna for yeah. awakening, right? Mm -hmm. But we can't channel the energy through shashumna for awakening if you can't even think of your baby toe. Exactly. So, <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah, but then what happens is we, you know, in today's, you know, glam, yoga glam age, you know, everyone's so obsessed with like doing a handstand or like shaking their asana on Instagram or doing mm -hmm. whatever big external posture. I mean, it's all a show, which is all so external and it has nothing to do with actually the internal movement of the energy and like mm -hmm. paying attention to the direction of that internal energy, which is very much married to our breath, right? The movement yeah. of prana. Yeah. And, and, and again, in a way, it's like adds this extra layer of, of a vidya or like, like, you know, confusion, misperception about what yoga actually is. Like, it's not muscling your way into postures or mm -hmm. holding a mm -hmm. handstand for 10 minutes or a shoulder stand for five minutes. It's, it's the mind and like feeling the movement of energy in that. Right. Yep. And yep. I think 
It's but like it, a subtle yeah. shift in our focus. Like you can hold these things for a long period of time. Yeah. But like where's your mind and what's the purpose? Right? Like what's the intention in the pose? Right? Yeah. Yeah, or because for yourself even, in the pose, maybe. <laughs> yeah, I was thinking as we're saying this, it's like the sankalpa is so important. What is the intention? Because to be fair, you know, I have some friends here in Bern and I find them quite dedicated in what they do, but they practice in a very different way than I do. In the, mm -hmm. in their, their movement is much more free, but the, the intention behind it is also to become aware of how prana moves in their body to really feel the dance of that and connect to it. And within that, there's some dedication and structures and some ways of moving and some and encouragement of how you would do that. So I think there can be many different exactly. genres of music, but 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 yeah. the idea is how do we work with the notes, you know? And yeah. so you're right, it's not the, the five minutes of the headstand is not the point, it's that the, the length of time allows the stillness to come. And if the intention is there that I want to become more aware, I want to yeah. feel what's happening pranically, then the length of time is useful in this case, yeah, yeah. for instance. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I love that. Yeah. I love the analogy mm -hmm. to music because I think, again, it relates back to learning. You have to learn mm -hmm. the basics. you got to learn some scales. You have to understand yeah. what notes work well together <laughs> yes, if you want yeah. to, you know, to make, make it. music, any kind yeah. of music. You have to mm -hmm. have a, an understanding of what sounds good, you know, whether yeah. it's heavy metal or classical music. <laughs> I mean, there's the essence is kind yeah. of the same in a way, right? Yeah. I think that's why, you know, somebody like I'm, I'm a little bit intrigued or I have been for a long time with somebody like Rick Rubin, who, who is, you know, a, a great producer of music is he's able to move between genres because the intention behind it is to bring out the essence of this creative force, you know, yeah. so that it doesn't matter whether it's hip hop or, or yeah. grunge or, or country yeah. music or what, yeah. 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 It was really, it was really interesting. My son plays the bass in his band and listening to a conductor, a professor who is a, a musician, a conductor, give a lecture to them and, and having him teach them how to listen to music and what makes music good. Right. And how mm. each section of something is highlighting, like whether, you know, here, this is the trumpets being highlighted and now the trumpets have to be quiet because we're highlighting the flutes and like how the music itself is actually movement of sound around space and it was like it was so profound listening to him because i thought to myself i've never thought about music like that before in my whole life yeah and what a beautiful kind of way to hear music and so now i i always hear music very differently just based yeah. on like this five minute lecture <laughs> that he was giving them and like also having them practice and demonstrate and you know keep repeating a section of a piece and change little things and just hearing these minute changes how it brought everything to life and they sounded so much better after sort of you know repeating it several times with different kind of emphasis one part getting higher one part getting lower one part you know uh, different ways of playing the notes, like so subtle, such subtle, subtle things. But it changed the whole experience. <laughs> yeah. And once you've, I mean, it's beautiful, but it's interesting too, right? Because once it's been pointed out to you, yeah, you can you never can. <laughs> not hear that. And that's also beautiful in our tradition, isn't it? Yeah. It's like you yeah. can't, you can't be conscious of something which is unconscious. So the only way to create that, mm -hmm. that's why it's so funny. Like people, you know, you go to the bookstore and it's full of all of these self-help books. But I mean, you, it's hard to do that unless there's some method to awaken that which is mm. covered. Yeah. And, and then yeah. once, that, once the consciousness is brought there through whatever practice it is, it's hard to ever see it again without seeing <laughs> yes. that. Like like you say, yeah. you'll never hear music. You will always hear yeah. music in a different way now. 
And that comes out of this mastery or, or out of this, this way of teaching something and allowing it to become conscious in somebody. It's, it's amazing what you just said, because it's, you know, you, you study some art and then you learn something a little bit about what's behind that. You dive a little bit mm -hmm. past the surface and then you see it in a different way forever. Yeah. 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 It's beautiful. But like in order to, again, it's interesting because in order to really teach that, right? Mm -hmm. Like I couldn't just like stand up there now after hearing it. It's like I got a beautiful taste of of how he's hearing music, but like, my God, he's hearing music on a whole different level than yeah, yeah. I'm hearing music. Yeah, yeah. And in order to really teach that and transmit that and help other people also be able to not just hear it, but to then play it and do that, you really need that level of mastery, which only comes from the repetition again and again and again and the practice over and over and over again and going deeper and deeper and deeper so that you can hear those minor subtle inflections, right? And so then to practice yeah. and study with someone like this kind of mastery is, um, yeah, it's a profound experience because, because you're getting the depth of their years of going deep into the subject. And I think that does a full circle back to what we were talking about, which is like really coming to be with a teacher together. And there's so much that you get out of that through, you know, and I think you can do it online to a certain extent if you are coming to work with a teacher, right? And you're not just going mm -hmm. to a million different workshops or a million different teachers and classes. Mm -hmm. But if you're coming to really study with a single teacher, you know, and then maybe, yeah, you have a couple of like little highlight workshops and or retreats or different things mm -hmm. that you're doing with other people, but really going to the depth of understanding um, yourself with the help of another. I mean, because I think that's really what it all comes down to, right? As a teacher, you're mm -hmm. helping the student understand themselves on a deeper level when it comes yep. to yoga. You can't really get to that depth without developing that relationship and that relationship comes with time and that relationship comes with consistency yes yeah long long time with the heart consistently yeah. right yeah 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 over and over again what for is a long, it? What is long it? time Sat Satu Dirga Kala Kala Nairantarya Satkara Sevito Dritta Bhumini yeah I always liked that one I like how yeah. it sounded yeah yeah, yeah, that's a good one. Yes, it's beautiful. So, beautiful. So tell everyone where they can find you now um, that you're, you've moved into your cave. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I have a studio called Svarupa. Svarupa, the, yeah. the sense of one's uh, essential nature. Form. Yeah, form. Yeah, essential form. Svarupa. So, I, I mean, I have a website, svarupa.com, and steven.svarupa is my Instagram handle and yeah my wife and i are based here in Bern. she's uh, studying ayurveda and teaching wonderful yoga and um, and um, i teach in Bern and zurich and i teach a little bit online and all of that can be found through the website and when the when the beautiful. karma leads someone they will lead yes. someone yeah, yeah exactly yes, beautiful. thanks harmony well, amazing thank to you chat. so much for being here yeah thank you it's amazing thank you Well, I hope that you enjoyed that little walk down memory lane with myself and Stephen. We would love to hear about the year that you first started practicing Ashtanga Yoga. Who was your first teacher? And when did you get introduced to the practice? Take a pic of yourself, a little selfie, post it into your stories, and tag us with the year that you started practicing Ashtanga Yoga. Bonus points if you mention who your first teacher was, just for fun, and we can... Uh, repost and tag you back. You can tag us at Finding Harmony Podcast. We'd love to meet you and get to know who our listeners are and connect with you on Instagram. Be sure to stay tuned next week when Stephen and I look at how breath work and pranayama has exponentially grown and expanded since we were first introduced to the pranayama practices, but especially in the last four years, what's gone on in the world of breathing. So it's a really great 
part two to this part one, and I know you're going to love it and also learn a lot about what it was like in the early days trying to find someone to teach you pranayama practices. So I hope you'll stay tuned and join in with us next week at listening to the Finding Harmony podcast. That's it. We've concluded another episode of the Finding Harmony podcast. I just want to thank you so much for doing the work that changes the world, starting with yourself. It truly does make a huge difference. Please make sure you have your automatic downloads turned on wherever you listen so you don't miss any of the upcoming episodes. I have so much more magic I can't wait to share with you. Lastly, if you're on Instagram, I love connecting and hearing from you. So come on over and say hello at Finding Harmony Podcast. And you can also come say hello to me personally at Harmony Slater Official. Thank you again for being here. I cannot wait to share more with you in our next episode.